Bah Humbug, another holiday season ruined by the Sussex drama for the royal family. Let's check out the most savage reviews of Endgame. These are my LA Diaries. Are you sick of me yet? Oh my gosh, what a week. Don't answer that. Endgame has landed on bookshelves to disastrous reviews and reaction online. The New York Times wrote that the book sounded like a press release cooked up by ChatGPT, while Richard Eden of the Daily Mail wrote in Palace Confidential that he planned to ask his local bookstore to move it from the biography section to the fiction one. Amazon buyer reviews are no tamer. Kathleen coins Omid's latest project, boring and too wordy. Sounds like an episode of LA Diaries. The verified buyer criticized both Omid and the Sussexes, stating Omid has the same bloated opinion of himself as Harry and Meghan have about themselves. Omid, Harry, and Meghan offer nothing new, Kathleen says. They hammer away, restating the obvious with nothing new or interesting. Now, at the time of this publication, Harry and Meghan have not officially reacted to Omid Scobie's endgame or tried to distance themselves from it, you know, as themselves without a third party. However, Omid Scobie has said on his life, on his family's life, that Harry and Meghan have had nothing to do with this particular book. Emily titled her judgment, I only have myself to blame for this purchase. She justifies her one-star review by explaining, I was looking forward to any possible new insight into the inner sanctum of the firm and was left not only disappointed, but downright angry as well. Not only am I angry that I wasted my time reading a glorified press release via Camp Sussex, I should chime in here, allegedly, but I'm also put off by the holier-than-thou tone used by the author. Say it ain't so, Emily. She pleads with her fellow Amazon shoppers, please do not subject yourself to the contents of whatever it is that the author was trying to do here. Stephanie titled her review, A Hatchet Job with Rubbish Writing. She writes, this is a poorly written hatchet job against the Royals, which has been aimed at boosting the brand of the moaning Sussexes who have lied on multiple occasions. I wish zero stars were an option. She generously gave one, I should note. Steph continues, if the book is true, the Netflix doc is false. If the Oprah interview is true, the the book is false. I'm tired of trying to sort out these two and can't wait for this horrible house of cards to come tumbling down. Enough is enough. Love Bios drops a Pierce Morgan mention that 37 people have found helpful. The review titled Lies Upon Lies says Pierce Morgan is mentioned twice in the book. I'm going to interject here to say Pierce himself says he's mentioned three or four times. On his show this week, Morgan said that both things attributed to him were out and out lies. I hope that more of the people lied about in the book come forward to expose Scobie. After all, the royals are not able to do so. And that is in reference to their never complain, never explain strategy. M.A. uses the opportunity to defend Catherine, the Princess of Wales. In their one star review titled Bias, they state, I find particularly unjust and despicable the attacks on Kate. She had her fair share of very cruel abuse in the beginning and pulled through. Not fair to go after her. 431 people have found that review helpful at this time. They are seemingly Team Catherine, and can you blame them? Now, Genevieve doesn't hold back, so settle in with a nice cup of hot chocolate and some peppermint bark. It begins... I read every modern royal biography and felt this was very important to read given the author's history of receiving information directly from the Duke and Duchess of Sussex. I will jump in right here to say Omid and Harry and Meghan all stress that they have not ever worked directly with each other. But in court documents, it was revealed that Harry and Meghan's spokesperson did work with the authors of Finding Freedom. So they technically did work with them through a third party. Meghan had to apologize to the court for that. Back to Genevieve's review. I found his other offering Finding Freedom to be biased, but readable. It definitely presented Harry and Meghan in the best light, but it wasn't cruel to others. And now I wonder if that restraint came from Scobie's co-author, Carolyn Duran. 
This is where I go ding, 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 ding. Me too. I wonder the same thing. Because this book is nasty, it paints every other member of the royal family as a one-dimensional villain and consistently fails to reckon with how Meghan and Harry's decision to expose private family information has driven their estrangement from the rest of the family. Harry at one point is described as having deep pockets due to prudent financial investments and big balls to take on the media. He and Meghan are treated as if their charity and commercial work, which has gone poorly since their exit, is building up to something visionary. They are also described as blissfully happy. Any negative rumors about their own behavior are swiftly brushed over. It was particularly notable in the chapter that mentioned Samantha Cohen and painted her exit from their team as amicable and friendly. In contrast, Genevieve says, the chapters on others are venomous and explore every nasty rumor from every corner of the internet gleefully in a way that invites the reader to believe they are probably true. Yes, he credits TikTok users in his acknowledgments. So that's cool. She ends her one-star review by explaining, this is one that says more about the author and his sources than it does anything of substance, and I regret reading it. This Kindle customer post sounds a bit like an Omid fan. Their two-star review explains that the book wasn't worth the hype, though. So disappointing, they said. Boring, nothing new, like an AI bot just gathered all of the last four years of headlines and smashed them into a book. Narrator was very good, not their fault. They had old news. I wanted to like this book so much. Scobie let us down. Well, Kindle customer, there is probably a support group for that you might see Harry and Meghan there near the clever coffee and sweets table. Now let me crack your cranium and fertilize your brain. I struggle with the idea of calling a book that is mostly just regurgitated stories endgame. When the most salacious story is that his majesty has his shoelaces ironed, a man with holes in his socks and recycled suits that are older than I am, a man that likely wears a huge percentage of other businessmen waxed cotton shoelaces, that sounds messy on an ironing board, is Endgame really the proper description? Endgame sounds like the type of book that's going to out one of the most highly debated mysteries in royal history. Yet, despite the names of two members of the royal family being identified in the Dutch translation of Omid's Endgame, Scobie claims he's never included any names in his book. Then, before you could say recollections may vary, a journalist for Daily Mail located in Holland named Paul Thompson located Omid's Dutch translator. From her doorstep, Saskia Peters stressed to Paul that King Charles III and the Princess of Wales were named in the manuscript she received and transcribed from English to Dutch. Saskia insists that she did not add the names to the Dutch version of the book, and the names of the royals were there in black and white. I did not add them. I just did what I was paid to do, and that was translate the book from English into Dutch. In their exclusive, the Daily Mail describes Mrs. Peters as clearly shocked and nervous at the firestorm her translation had caused. But Omid remains defiant as ever, refusing to apologize for the chaos during an interview with the BBC and what the Daily Mail described as a tense BBC interview. Scobie was given the opportunity to say he was sorry to the royal family, but instead insisted, it's not for me to apologize because I still want to know what's happened. Taking the Harry and Meghan victimhood narrative to a whole new level, he explained that he was extremely proud of a book that's been completely overshadowed by an event that's caused him a lot of frustration. Poor Omid. I hope... I hope he was able to cry into his Louis Vuitton backpack because I'm pretty sure Kate had a worse evening last night having to deal with these accusations while in front of a ton of paparazzi. I've settled down now. Last week, we told you about Kitson, LA's holiday hypocrisy window display that features Harry and Meghan. This week, I spoke to the founder of Kitson on the Today for Daily podcast, Fraser Ross, said that it was his shopper's that nominated Harry and Meghan for the window display translation. If the TMZ rumors are true and Harry and Meghan are actually looking to move closer to LA in LA, those people that nominated them for the window display would be their neighbors. Now, Ross also said Americans might cut the Sussexes some slack if Meghan was nicer to her father. Take a listen. 
I, don't, I think the big backlash she gets is how she's treated her father. And oh, people yes. realize that, you know, it's he's, you know, in his last legs of his life, probably, you know, in his age. And maybe she's seen them and maybe she's not, but she's vocal about everything else. She said she, I think if she reconciled with them, she'd get a lot of positive press. Frazier, I had somebody message me today and say, why won't the king invite Harry and Meghan to Sandringham for Christmas this year. And I said, well, probably self-preservation, but you know who would not turn them down for Christmas? Thomas Markle. He would welcome them with open arms. Absolutely. Why are we always trashing the royal family when Meghan is you know, not, not communicating with her family either? Well, he's an hour flight away, not 11 hour flight away. Um, now, the, the reason you've gone viral over the last few weeks is your latest holiday display. Your window is, you're telling a story. You're telling a story about what happened over the last 12 months and you're holding people accountable and it's not mean spirited. Wouldn't you agree? No, it's not mean spirited because the media already talked about it. And I, I you know, we ask public opinion, you know, we go on our Instagram maybe a month before and we ask people who should be on this year and why. And, you know, a lot of people commented Markle and Harry should be on and Oprah and The Rock. I mean, they were up there. Hey, now I know that you used to carry Team Meghan and Harry and Team William and Kate shirts. Yeah. Is it true that William and Kate's tops outsold Harry and Meghan's when they were in kits and stores? Oh, 20 to 1. Wow. To one. Yeah, 100 wow. We started that whole team craze with Team Aniston, Team Jolie, that became an international success. Um, and it was, you know, uh, it was really 25 to 1 for Aniston. But it, it maybe slipped at the at the end. It went maybe 25 to 3 because more came out. I mean, we did Team Paris, Team Nicole, you know, on and on and on. You can catch more of my interview with Kitson's Fraser Ross wherever you listen to podcasts. I want to know, do you think Megan should reach out to her dad this holiday season? Let me know in the comments below. I've had one crazy week, so I think I'm going to go take a nap now.